Good afternoon and welcome to our Noonday Bible Study where we continue our series on biblical doctrine. And in most biblical doctrine books, after you deal with the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you often deal with creation. So that's what we're going to address on today. Uh, give some hearts, give some thumbs up, show some love, uh, let everybody know that you are here. Share uh, this live Bible study, if you will. And let's be in prayer together for this Bible study. Let it be impactful. Let it be insightful. Let it be encouraging to you. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you for this time of study. God, I hope and pray that we grow as we study your word. Help us to not only take notes, but to take note within our heart, mind, and soul of what the word of God has to say for us not only what it has to say for us, but also to us. God, I pray that the, this word, the, these seeds fall on fertile soil. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that someone is empowered. Lives are changed today because of the word of God. We pray for all generations. We pray for New Hope Baptist Church, God. Bless all of the membership, the sick among us, the young, the old. God, bless each and every ministry. God will be ever so careful to give you the glory, honor, thanks, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. So the doctrine of creation, the author, Paul David Tripp, in his book, 12 Essential Bible Doctrines, he talks about it is impossible in a sentence, paragraph, or even a chapter, or even a whole book to do justice to the once in the history of the universe wonder of the creation of the world and everything that is in it. You and I have to work hard to make anything. It is difficult for us to make anything. Even when, <clears throat> even when you know all the ingredients, when you've done something over and over again, it still is difficult for us to uh, conceive something because it requires the grace of God. Uh, even when you buy a piece of furniture from Ikea with all the pieces properly designed and a booklet of instructions, you are driven to the edge of your sanity sometimes, trying to follow the instructions and assemble something that represents what you thought you, you bought. All of our do-it-yourself projects require mental focus, physical dexterity, and perseverance. Paul David Tripp says, we struggle to make things, even though we always start with raw materials, we follow instructions and have collected the appropriate tools. But you and I have never created anything. We do not make something out of nothing. C.S. Lewis said it this way, this act of creation as it is for God must always remain totally inconceivable to man. For we, even our poets and musicians and inventors, never in the ultimate sense make. We only build. We always have materials to build from. The truth of creation should stop us in our tracks, fill us with awe and wonder, humble us and drop us to our knees. God with nothing more than his will and his word, literally, no exaggeration here, spoke the universe into existence. Think of huge galaxies and little ants. Think of flowing bodies of water and hardened shafts of granite. Think of the body of an elephant and the translucent creatures that swim in the deepest trenches of the sea. Think of huge towering trees and microscopic organisms. Think of the technology of the human eye and the intricate design of your hand. Think of sound waves and chemical reactions. Don't read Genesis 1 and 2 in some kind of mental monotone. Don't let the astonishing glory of what is being described elude you. Genesis 1 and 2 are meant to take your breath away, to put you in awe of God. And if they don't, you haven't handled them properly. Genesis 1 and 2 are meant to put you in your place and insert God in God's proper place in your heart and in your life. When we deal with the doctrine of creation, we should be in awe of God. It should catapult us to a place of reverence. There's nothing abstract, impersonal, or distant from your life in the words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. These words define and explain everything. They give you identity and dignity. 
These words define the meaning and purpose of life. Here in Genesis 1 and 2 is your introduction to everything. The biblical narrative begins with God on center stage doing something that is so mind-bending and mind-blowing that we will spend the rest of eternity unpacking it and trying to fully absorb its expansive glory. To say that God created this universe and everything in it is simply to say that God is God, that God has no rivals. No one and nothing compares to God. Remember that song? No one compares to you. You are so amazing. God is so amazing. No one can lay claim to his power and authority. No one has a mind that can contain this kind of wisdom and knowledge. And if someone were able to think up creating a world, they would completely lack the power of what God conceived to do what God did. And, and we'll deal more in our next uh, sessions with the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God, and the omnipresence of God. But today, let's stay with uh, creation. Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 and 2 is the game changer. If God created the world, then everything is defined by that reality. And God is worthy of our constant all submission and obedience. But most of us have a problem. Most of us have an issue. And author Paul David Tripp says he's afraid that the doctrine of creation has become so familiar to us that it no longer moves us in the way it should and once did. I argue also that many people neglect the doctrine of creation. They just say Adam and Eve were created. And then they say the fall happened, but not go into enough significant detail about what happened and how powerful God must be to paint the skies without a paintbrush, to plant the trees and, and to do so many wonderful things and to create humanity. God is God and there is no other like God. It means that the grace has met us and opened our hearts and minds to truth that God uses to rescue, redeem, and transform us. But it's important to understand that familiarity with biblical truth can also be a dangerous thing. When we bump across something with which we are familiar, our minds tend to quit thinking. We just absorb what we hear and assume what we've been told. Our eyes tend to quit looking and our hearts stop responding. It is sad. When considering something like the doctrine of creation becoming just an intellectual exercise and no longer fills our minds with wonder and hearts with worship, how is it possible to watch the hands of God at work, forming the world and putting things in place, yet pass on by unnoticing and unmoved? So many people have come become numb to the movement of God, but I pray for a high level of spiritual sensitivity for each and every one of you. I hope that God can open your eyes and heart to the glory that is everywhere around you. Every glorious and magnificent created thing is designed by God to be a finger, a sign, and a glance that points to his glory. We need to pray for grace that we would always see the glorious one who is behind the glorious physical things we are seeing, hearing, tasting, and touching. How can we boil water? How can we mash potatoes? How can we scramble eggs? How can we drive the car? How can we sense the air conditioner? How can we be on our iPads or iPhone without seeing the glory of God? How can we hold a beautiful baby and hold an infant in our hands without being in awe of that baby's creator? How can that ever-changing, variegated hues of sunset not produce all of God in us? And how God controls both the sun and the rain? How can tadpoles in a stream not make us smile? How can the whistle of the wind through the trees not become a hymn of praise in our hearts? How can we not be in awe of God's grace? If you're a Christian, this is the epicenter of everything you say you believe. If God did not create this world and everything in it, then every piece of biblical theology and history comes cr crashing down. Then God is not God. The world is not what God has said it is. You are not who you say you are. And everything you thought was true is something else. 
good biblical theology is creational theology. It's a theology that puts God at the beginning and in the center. Heavens and earth shapes our posture as we handle all of the other truth that unfold in the biblical narrative. Creational theology or theology that focuses solely on creation is a humble theology. And in Genesis 1 and 2, these things are not intended to be a scientific uh, description of the process of creation, although some people do study cosmogony and see how that affects or how it correlates scientifically with our theology. But it is clear that we do not have a detailed description of everything that happened as God was creating his world and putting everything in its place, every single intricate detail. Genesis 1 and 2 do record for us foundational historical facts, but in a way that is selective and poetic. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the comments now. I'm going to go to another resource that deals with biblical doctrine. He says, Hebrews 11, 3 says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. This translation, as well as the NIV, most accurately reflects the Greek Masoretic text. Though the text does not quite teach the doctrine of creation out of nothing, it comes close to doing so, since it says that God did create, not create the universe out of anything that is visible. This author also holds to the position that creation happened from nothing, that the earth was void, there was nothingness, and God made something out of nothing. And he believes because God created the entire universe out of nothing, no matter in the universe is eternal. All that we see, the mountains, the oceans, the stars, the earth itself, all came into existence when God created them. This reminds us that God rules over all the universe and that nothing in creation is to be worshipped instead of God or in addition to God. However, were we to deny creation out of nothing? we would have to say that some matter has always existed that is eternal like God. And we know that's not true because this idea would challenge God's independence, his sovereignty, and the fact that all glory, honor, praise, and worship is due to God alone. When we look at creation, we must deal with Adam and Eve. The Bible teaches that God created Adam and Eve in a special personal way. The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being and after that god created eve from adam's body so the lord god caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh the rib which the lord god had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to man as we shall see and some of us have already seen many Christians differ and debate on the extent to which evolutionary developments may have occurred after creation. And while there are sincerely held differences on the question amongst Christians as to everything that happened, who was, were they made at the same time? Was it just one person? So many different variations um, with respect to all of these positions. We want to focus on the awe of God and how God not, we don't want to deal with gender issues or debates. We want to deal with the fact that God created something out of nothing and in his own image. The special creation of Adam and Eve shows that though we may be like animals in many respects in our physical bodies, nonetheless, we are very different from animals. We are fearfully and wonderfully, and let me add, uniquely made by God. We are created in God's image, the pinnacle of God's creation, more like God than any other creature, which is why God gives us dominion, which does not abort or negate relationship and respect and reverence to animals, but rather God has made us special and appointed to rule over the rest of creation. Even the brevity of the Genesis account of creation places a wonderful emphasis on the importance of humanity in distinction from the rest of the universe. Now, this does not give us license to mistreat animals or to not value all of God's creation, including the trees, but rather it holds us accountable 
for the world that we live in. We are responsible for the upkeep of the kingdom of God. And if we don't value God's treasure, it will fall to pieces and it will be humanity's fault. Amen. So I like what he has to say there and I'm gonna come back to that author in a little bit because he answers a very important question when people talk about creation. But before we get to that, I wanna go back to how creation theology helps us define purpose. Why are we here? The author says, God, the ultimate artist, designed everything he made with a purpose in mind. That's right. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for your family. God has a purpose for your church, the ministry you serve. Everything has purpose. If you're not walking in that purpose, you are wasting your time. Each thing is carefully designed by God for the purpose for which God intended. So God designed human beings with the purpose in mind. He knew what he wanted us to be. He knew how he wanted us to live. He knew what he wanted us to do. He knew how he wanted us to relate to one another and to him. And he knew how he wanted us to interact with the rest of creation. This means that the ultimate goal of our lives is not working so that we will one day finally experience our definition of happiness. The goal isn't making sure that everyone loves us, likes us on Instagram, or follows us on Facebook. The purpose of your life is not material achievement, success, or affluence. The ultimate purpose is not acquiring power and control. It's not being fit and beautiful. It's not public acclaim. It's not finally loving yourself, which is important. The ultimate goal is not a happy marriage and responsible and successful children. It's not a boat. It's not how many times you can travel outside the country. It's not how many credit cards you have, how many millions of dollars you can acquire. No, if there is a creator, then it's not my place to choose how I want to invest my life or decide what I want my purpose to be as creator. God alone has the ability and the right to tell us how to live and what the driving purpose for each and every one of our lives should be. God designs us in such a certain way for a certain purpose. And this means that making God's purpose for us the driving purpose of our life should be our deepest motivation and our constant commitment. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. No matter who we are or where we're living, the doctrine of creation teaches us we do not look to ourselves for purpose, but that we look to God, our creator. And the creator has sent us into the world with an owner's manual, just like the ones that comes with a new car. God's manual, the Bible, not only lays out God's purpose for us, it also shows us what happens when we forsake God's purpose for our own, as well as how God rescues and restores us through the gift of grace, get the, through the gift of grace, through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of being sent with purpose, having purpose, serving and saving, redeeming, being used in a mighty way. You say being used, he's part of the Trinity. The Bible tells us God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so we believe that Jesus Christ in the flesh, the word that became flesh is deity. And he was on assignment. And he followed his purpose. And you too can fulfill your purpose. Paul David Tripp often refers to uh, paintings. He was a painter. And one of the things he says is when he's done with a painting, it belongs to him. Nobody questions it. Nobody challenges it. He owns every painting in his studio. Every one of his paintings are, have been hung up in exhibits. He owns all the paintings that he has put up in his home. And it is the logic of creation. If you make it, you own it. So it is with God's creation of the world and everything in it. The physical universe belongs to the Lord. It was created by him and for him. My favorite verse in all of scripture, Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. God is the rightful owner of all things, treating the physical world as if it belongs to you to do with whatever you want, never goes anywhere good. It is not yours. Everything is the Lord's. Lords, the trees, the flowers, the streams, the birds, the animals of all kinds, the sky there, everything belongs to God. 
we must recognize that God is the owner, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. We must interact with and steward the environment God has placed us in. Plants, animals, land, air, water, with the humble recognition that none of this belongs to us. This means we, we are the stewards or resident managers of a place made by the Lord for God's glory and held together by his power. So with humility, thankfulness, and commitment, we give ourselves to care for what belongs to God so that God will be pleased and get the credit that is due him and him alone. This stewardship doesn't extend just to our physical environment, but to each other as well. We are called to represent God's love and care for all those made in God's image. As his stewards and resident managers, we must take seriously our calling to represent to one another God's love, God's justice, God's compassion, God's mercy, God's protection, God's provision, and so much more in recognition of who God is and his ownership. We commit ourselves to a stewardship lifestyle toward our neighbor, never turning our back on suffering of any kind until we are in that place where suffering is no more. Never forsaking our brother or sister, but having compassion, not because we might be in that position one day, which is true, but because we're called to love one another. God's creator ownership calls us to one more thing and it's important every morning of your life to remind yourself that you don't belong to you either all kinds of dark and unholy things all kinds of selfish and abusive actions so much hurt and destruction so much idolatry and addiction and so many sad endings result when human beings live like they own their own lives and can do whatever they want so many problems sexual abuse emotional abuse Racism, prejudice, corruption, materialism, um, food addictions, adultery, thievery, violence, selfishness, gossip, misogyny. So many things happen when people think everything is all about them and rather than realizing the fact that everything, every focus should be on God. Here's what the doctrine of creation teaches us. I don't own my rationality, spirituality, personality, emotionality, physicality, psychology, gifts, or volition. Everything I am that is all that works together to make me me belongs to the Lord. All that I am and all that I will ever be belongs to thee. To God be the glory for the things he has done. A life well lived is lived with the understanding that you don't belong to you, but even you belong to God. The author really focuses on this point because so many people become self-centered and lose this focus. But the doctrine of creation teaches us that we are to be stewards of every creation, every gift that God has presented and placed in our hands. The doctrine of creation leads us to the grace of Jesus. The doctrine of creation properly understood leads us to the cross. It is there where we find forgiveness for every creator forgetful moment. Every time we think we created something, we did it, we started it, we pat ourselves on the back. Yes, it's good to encourage yourself, but you also must celebrate God. It is there that we are rescued from Satan's sin and self and employed to live for something and someone vastly bigger than us. It is there where we are liberated from the burden of living for our own glory, and we find freedom of living for the glory of God. It is there where we are reminded of this reality, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The doctrine of creation drives us closer to God. It is only because God is with us, for us, and in us, that we must submit to God's will, God's ownership, and recognize God's greatness and live according to God's purpose. Any questions? Amen. If not, the doctrine of creation leads us when it comes to God's authority. Since God made the world and everything in it and owns it, He's the ultimate authority over everything. 
This means that there is no such thing as independent human authority. Anyone who has a position of authority as a human being has representative authority. All human authority is ambassadorial. That is, it is designed to be a visible representation of the authority of God. Paul says it this way, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Whether you're a parent, spouse, teacher, boss, politician, manager, judge, pastor, or some other authority figure, you have been placed there by God to be a representative of his authority. That's why whenever we have elections, I pray that the Holy Spirit leads the people to vote the right way. And whoever is involved in the decision-making process, that God leads them and that they recognize they're not making decisions based on their bank accounts, but for God's purpose and for God's will to be done. That's, at least that's what they should be doing. Um, as a vessel of God, recognizing the authority of God. You do not have the right to wield your power and position however you want. Every expression of human authority should be a representation of God's values, purposes, and character. Wouldn't the home be a safe and more loving place if parents saw this and they lived like this? Wouldn't the classroom work better if teachers understood that? Wouldn't the workplace be more peaceful and productive if bosses led this way? All of our authority comes from God, for God is the ultimate authority. All other authority looks to him for his character and purpose. It is vital to remember that the most powerful human leaders are the ones whose rule is the largest and who possess the highest of human authority, yet at the same time live under God's authority. Even the greatest of leaders is called to bow down before the ultimate king and will willingly submit their authority. And so, it is important for leaders to understand you must submit to good leadership. And there's no greater leadership than the authority of God. I want to deal with one more piece in this book before I, I jump back to the other book and then we'll be through. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the comments. The stunning, shocking, gripping account of creation, which is the first thing you encounter when you open your Bible, is there for a reason. Your Bible is written in such a way that you encounter God in all the extent and magnitude of his glory. Right away from the beginning, you witness God doing something that you will never see rivaled or repeated. And I hear you talking, well, what about Anuma Elish and the other creation stories? No creation narrative rivals or competes with the Bible. This one who existed before time, before the physical universe existed, speaks everything that is into existence. With words, he calls things into being. His glorious power, wisdom, and authority are not hidden for a moment. From the very first words of scripture, they are spotlighted for every reader to see. God, big, glorious, and powerfully active, dominates reality when faced with this incredible display of all surpassing greatness. You can't help but feel small and weak and submissive to a great and mighty God. The original sight and sound multi-sensory technicolor glory display was meant to astound you, to overwhelm you, and to change you. It has been retained to stimulate in you the most significant, intimate, profound, and formative of all human functions, worship. You should feel compelled to worship when you see how God turned midnight into day and how God has transformed things in your life. That no matter how dark the hour, no matter how much you feel like nothing or it seems like nothing is going your way, the same way God made this beautiful world, God can redefine things in your life. And one of the things you should do in response to the recognition of God's greatness in creation is worship. Yes, God is so great. And we are one, one of our purposes, uh, part of our purpose in life is to worship God.
Worship is more than a spiritual religious activity. Worship is our identity. It's what we were made for, what we were called to do. Genesis 1 and 2 present to us in incredible glory, the only one who is worthy of the worship drive and the worship capacity of our hearts. The worship of something will shape everything we say and do. I can tell a worshiper a mile away, not just by what they do in worship, but how they live. For true worship shifts your actions, your mindset, how you talk to people and interact with people is informed and influenced by a grateful heart. It shows reverence to our great creator, redeemer, and sustainer. So in the only once in the world display of incredible divine ability at creation, you and I are meant not only to find God, but also to find ourselves through worship. We are required to be intimate with God, to get to know him, and there's no escaping the light of his majesty. And once you get in touch with the master and have an encounter with God, your life will never be the same. There's no avoiding the shadow of his power. And, and Genesis 1 and 2 leave us nowhere to run or hide. God is too overwhelmingly huge to avoid. The glory of his majesty completely fills the stage that we may have thought was ours. From the beginning, God invites us to know him, experience his grandeur, and give ourselves to the only thing that makes sense, worship. This is not worship as a religious part of our lives, but rather, Worship that is the offer of our lives to this one who alone has ushered us into the place where we are witnesses to the glorious glory of God. The doctrine of creation is not only something to catapult us to worship. It is meant to release us from our bondage to us. It is meant to welcome us out of the prison of our own self-centeredness. And Genesis 1 and 2 remind us that we are but witnesses to something we had no part in. The world didn't begin with and wasn't started by us. The great narrative of the cosmos didn't begin with us. The most amazing thing that ever happened happened without us. And if called upon, there's no way that we could have done even the most minuscule piece of what God, the great creator, did when he spoke into existence. Existence. He was there in awesome grandeur and glory before the first human breath was taken. And the doctrine of creation reminds me that I am not at the center of what is. God is not only the great author of the story of life, he is also the principal actor, the great star that dominates the stage and compels our attention. Everything comes from him, everything points to him, and everything continues to him. He gets the spotlight, he gets the glory, he gets the accolades, and he is the one who takes home the honors. He humbles all who stand in the light of his glory. There is no greatness debate to be had. There is no one who could seriously claim to be God's equal. All creation bows to God's majesty. Here's what the humbling process of grace begins. As you begin to bow to his centrality and confess your sin, your smallness, and dependency of God, you begin to be free from the dangerous delusions of your own majesty. Here's where you begin to forsake your reliance on your own wisdom and power. Here's when you quit trying to write your own story, but you recognize that whatever God has planned for you, whatever purpose God is willing for you in your life is greater than what you could do. And you start to be free from your obsessions with your own glory and your constant need to be right and to be in control and to be acclaimed. And you give up so many things Here's where God in love and mercy invites you to confess and to surrender and to see and experience greater. I want you to experience the greatness of God in your life. Someone watching right now has been wrestling and trying to do things on their own, but God wants you to just put it all down and recognize that he is the great I am. The great and wonderful gospel narrative, which is the hope of all who believe, does not begin with the arrival of Jesus. Redeeming grace flows at Genesis 1. The display of God's glory is at the same time the pouring out of his mercy. It beckons you away from the dysfunction and disaster of selfishness and self-glory to find your life in surrender to God. Divine love welcomes you in to see the most glorious display of majesty ever, even though you could have never afforded the ticket. God paid it all. 
It is love that confronts you with God. Big, dominant, and all-surpassing in humbling you, God extends you his grace. Can anybody say amen? If you know that to be true, come on, type in the comments, amen. God is amazing. God is wonderful. And God gets the glory. Creation is an amazing narrative. I just want to say a few things. The Holy Spirit was so at work in creation that the Ruach of God, the breath of God, which also in different contexts means spirit, impacted nothing and made it something. Job even said, the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. We must honor the Trinity's involvement in creation and how God took nothing and made it something. And God has even taken us from nothing and nowhere and given us eternal life. The teaching of scripture about the relationship between God and creation is unique among the religions of the world. The Bible teaches that God is distinct from his creation. If God was equal with us, we wouldn't need God, but he is distinct. He does not depend upon us, but we are fully dependent on him. And God is still very much involved with his creation. He did not create us from afar and just say, you have it, but rather God wants intimate relationship with work, constantly talking to him in prayer, engaging him in worship, or just living holy and righteous lives. Yes, the creation is distinct from the creator, but the creator will never leave us nor forsake us because he loves us that much. When we affirm that God created the universe to show his glory, it is important that we realize that he did not need to create it. He did not need to create you, but he chose you. This past Sunday, I preached a sermon entitled The Chosen Ones. And we ought to thank God that God chose us regardless of our imperfections or faults or flaws. God chose us. And the universe God created was good. We see it in the Bible. At the end of each stage of creation, God saw that what he had done was good. Then at the end of the six days of creation, God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. God is good. God is great. And God created good things. God delighted in the creation that he had made just as he had purposed to do. Even though there is now sin in the world, the material creation is still good in God's sight and should be seen as good by us as well. This knowledge will free us from a false asceticism that sees the use and enjoyment of the material creation as wrong. Paul says that everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for then it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Again, Paul says everything created by God is good and must be received with prayer and thanksgiving, and then it is consecrated. So the created order can be used in so many different ways. We must acknowledge the power, the greatness, and the grace of God. <clears throat> I want to move on to a question that often comes up when we talk about creation. And that is, and I don't want to deal with evolution today or the scientific nature. I dealt a little bit with cosmog um, cosmogony earlier, uh, but I want to deal with something else. I can't get to it. Pardon me, going too fast. I think I skipped something that I felt was very important to deal with. A question that often comes up when we talk about God and creation. <clears throat> I don't see it in that book, but I will go to another resource and hopefully deal with it there. But first, we'll, we'll close out on David Tripp when he talks about creation in our everyday living. The doctrine of creation calls us to live like we own nothing. It calls us to recognize the goodness and the greatness and the grace of God and recognize that we are merely stewards of God's creation.
The doctrine of creation reminds us that life is a glory war. God made his world a pleasurable place and he did it. And he designed us with the ability to take in and enjoy those pleasures. Enjoying the pleasurable glories of creation is not sin, but being ruled by those pleasures is sin. We must be careful that we do not get so consumed and caught up in things of this world that we make those things our God. We must be careful that we do not allow anything on this here earth be so wonderful and enjoyable that we forget about the goodness of our God. We must be careful in so many ways that what we do does not bring glory to ourselves, but rather brings glory to God. Amen. Author Paul David Tripp encourages us to keep asking the best, most practical question ever. Recognizing God as the creator of heaven and earth and everything in them past, poses us with a question. It may be the best, most practical question you could ask yourself right here, right now, between your conversion and your entrance into the presence of Jesus. What is God's purpose for my life? You must ask yourself this question. Asking this question reminds you of your place in the world. You are not the designer or the ultimate craftsman. You are the product of God's craftsmanship. So you should always be asking, what was I made for? And what is the reason for these things in my life? Because God is gracious. <clears throat> God is gracious, kind, and wise. He answers this question again and again in his word, addressing particular things with divine wisdom and clarity. Earlier, we looked at the issue of purpose, but we also must look at practicality, um, how we get to our purpose. Sometimes it's through pain. Often it's through experience. Often it's through transformation and qualifying. Often your faith is tested. Before faith can be trusted, it must be tested. So yes, you may go through truffle, trials for a little while. You may suffer for a little while, but know that God has a purpose in all these things as well. We also must be reminded when it comes to creation, we are created to care for the world that God made, the birds, the bees, the flowers, and the trees. Yes, we have dominion, but that holds us accountable. That does not mean we can ne neglect, mistreat, or abandon something, but rather we are to be good stewards of God's creation. And then last but not least, I wanna address the question of good, and evil. If God created everything, then why is there evil in the world? I'm going to go back to a following resource, which deals with good and evil. And he basically says, I'm reading it. God created us God also gave us free will. God has given us opportunities to make choices and decisions. And some of those decisions are not perfect. Some of the things that humanity does is outside of the will of God. But even with these challenges, even with these things present, God still loves us. God still uses us. And God still continues to work things out for our good. In some cases, the presence of evil helps us to value and appreciate the presence of good. And so be not dismayed, whatever be tied, even in the attack of enemies, in the presence of enemies, God will take care of you. Thank you for tuning in to our Bible study. Love you with the love of Christ. God bless.